Good morning. Good morning, and welcome to the Emanuel Lutheran Church member of the Evangelical Lutheran Synod on this ninth Sunday after Trinity, and our theme for today is A Little Something for Everyone. We begin with our first hymn, number 26, verses 1 through 4.
tribe as we begin on page 15 in the front of our hymnals. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O oh Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, or discipline me in your wrath. Be merciful to me, Lord, for I am faint. O oh Lord, heal me, for my emotions are in agony. My soul is in anguish. How long, O oh Lord, how long? Prepare, O oh Lord, and deliver me. Save me because of your unfailing love. No one remembers you when he is dead. Who praises you from the grave? I have torn out of the groaning. All night long I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with tears. My eyes grow weak with sorrow. They fail because of all my foes. Away from me, all you who do evil, for the Lord has heard my weeping. The Lord has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies will be ashamed in this day. They will turn back in sudden disgrace.
Let your merciful ears, O Lord, be open to the prayers of your humble servants, and that they may obtain their petitions, make them to ask such things as are pleasing to you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one true God, now and forever. The world finds greatness in accumulating wealth, wilding power, winning praise from people. But in pursuit of these goals, man has filled his world with hatred and greed and violence. In Christ, we find a whole new definition for greatness. God teaches us to find greatness in his love and in our service to others. Living by God's definition of greatness fills our lives with peace and fulfillment. In our first lesson, King David prays before the assembly. It is not a private prayer, but a prayer for his entire congregation. Here David praises God's glorious name in words of adoration by giving all glory to God alone and commits his people Israel into the Lord's care. Our first lesson is from the Old Testament reading of 1 Chronicles, chapter 29, verses 10 through 13, titled, David's Praise to God. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, O Lord, God of our father Israel. From everlasting to everlasting, yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and to give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. Here ended our first reading. Israel traveled through the wilderness. God protected them and provided for their every need. Yet they still had a powerful enemy that took many lives. The unbelief that lived within them. In our epistle lesson, Paul offers their example as a warning to us. God in his power can accomplish all things for us, even our salvation but we are still capable of losing it all if we choose to turn away from him in disobedient unbelief. The epistle lesson for this, the ninth Sunday after Trinity, is written in the 10th chapter of 1 Corinthians, reading verses 6 to 13. Now these things occur as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan rivalry. We should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did, and in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test the Lord, as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angels. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of ages has come. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Here endeth our epistle, we join in the gradual. Alleluia! Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers. Praise Him and highly exalt Him forever. Alleluia!
In this unique parable for our gospel lesson, Jesus points to an important lesson that we can learn from unbelievers. Resourcefulness in achieving our goals. To the dishonest manager, maintaining his comfortable lifestyle was his top priority. Therefore, he applied the great, great integrity to achieve this goal. The Christian goal is to get more souls into heaven. The worthy goal and the reason which Christ provides certainly calls for nothing less than our best efforts. The Holy Gospel is written in the 16th chapter of St. Luke, reading verses 1 through 9, titled, The Parable of the Unjust Servant. Please rise for the reading. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Jesus told his disciples, There was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management, because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, What shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I know what I will do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called each one of the master's debtors. He asked the first, How much do you owe my master? Eight hundred gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it four hundred. Then he asked the second, And how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, Take your bill, and make it eight hundred. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwelling. Here endeth the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Praise be to you. our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed found on page 22. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not me, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who saved by the prophets, and I believe one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for our next hymn.
May God the Holy Spirit bless our study this morning and help us to remember that all these things happen in Scripture as examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our text is written in Genesis 18, reading verses 1 through 15, which we will read throughout the sermon. Years ago there was, and maybe even today, there's an expression found in the Minnesota dialect, especially the Norwegians, when someone stops by for a visit during the time of a regular meal, the host will say to his visitors, since you are here, let's have a little lunch. If you've never had this opportunity, I should explain that a little lunch doesn't mean a couple of tiny sandwiches, although that's possible. The, little, uh, the expression, a little lunch, can include anything from a light lunch to a full-blown three-course meal. Let's have a little lunch means essentially sit down, let me get you something to eat. Dear fellow redeemed, when three men appeared suddenly in the vicinity of Abraham's tent door, the patriarch offered them a little lunch. We will see here that a morsel of bread meant more than a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It turned out to be a little something for everyone, which we will use as our theme this morning, a little something for everyone. First, we'll see how this occasion served as an opportunity for Abraham to exercise his faith and to provide for the needs of three strangers, the Lord and the two angels. Secondly, something for Sarah. The reason the Lord appeared was to confirm to her that his promise was indeed good and that she herself would give birth to a son within the year. Finally, we find that in this scripture there is a little something for each of us as we remember that God, uh, as we are reminded to look for opportunities to exercise our faith in love, dwell in God's promises and remember that God knows even the thoughts of our hearts and he still loves us. Abraham was 99 years old, taking a nap during the heat of the day, probably the early afternoon hours, and when he opened his eyes, he looked out the door of the tent and suddenly saw three men standing in the distance under one of the large trees. It probably wasn't a surprise to see people in this area since Abraham was camped near Hebron, likely along the road running north and south in the Judean hills. The scripture tells us then in verse 1 through 8, Then the Lord appeared to him, Abraham, by the Tenebrith tree in Ammon, as we, he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground and said, My Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring you a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts after that you may pass by inasmuch as you have come to your servant. They said, Do as you have said. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, Quickly, make three measures of fine meal kneaded and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd, took a tender and good calf, and gave it to a young man and hastened to prepare it. So he took butter and milk and the calf which he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree as they ate. 
Abraham saw what appeared to be three men. However, one of them was God the Father in human form. The others were angels appearing in human form. And there isn't any reason in this scripture that leads us to believe that Abraham recognized them for who they were. So here was Abraham's opportunity to exercise his faith to provide for the needs of others. Abraham urged the three strangers to sit down, to have water brought to wash their feet. Now, this was a common courtesy in the dusty, arid regions of Palestine. As you remember, they wore sandals. Abraham also offered to bring them a bit of bread. They agreed to stay for a bite to eat. Now, Abraham offered morsels of bread, which was more than a piece of bread. Sarah was instructed to use three measures, literally, 30 quarts of fine meal flour and make it into bread. In addition, he personally chose a young male calf, instructed the servant to butcher it and prepare it. He also gathered curds, which is a type of cheese and milk, and set a little lunch before them, and they ate before him. Now, we may wonder how the Lord God and two angels disguised as men could eat food, but let's remember that God can do anything. They didn't eat Abraham's food because they needed, but for his sake. And likewise, we remember after the resurrection of Jesus, he would later eat boiled fish and honeycomb before his disciples, not because he needed it, but because they needed to see him do that. Now, Abraham didn't join them in the lunch. He stood by like a servant, prepared to provide any other need. And do you think that Abraham's hospitality was unnecessary? If we think so, then perhaps we should review our own hearts. When the Apostle Paul speaks of fruit of the Spirit that is prompted by the Holy Spirit and produces a living faith within us, he describes these attitudes. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So when we walk down the street and see other people, or maybe even work with other people, we should train ourselves to see them all as people for whom Jesus died. Instead of looking down our noses at their shabby appearance or bearing grudges towards others, we should be ready to exercise our faith to show love towards others. Doing so, not to pat ourselves on our backs, but to glorify our Savior Jesus in all things. You can never tell when a smile or a hello can lead to a full-blown conversation that can lead to being a witness for Jesus and your faith in him. This wasn't the test for Abraham to see whether he would pass. This was, however, an opportunity for him to exercise his God-given faith. No doubt, thinking of this very event, the writer of the Hebrews encourages us in chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some have unwillingly entertained angels. Let us look for opportunities then to reflect Jesus' love to others, not only inviting strangers to our church, but to bring to them the saving message of Jesus. God grant us opportunities then to exercise our faith in acts of love towards others 
and not only to the ones we love. Now there was also something, a little something for Sarah. For as they were eating, or maybe after they finished, the three men began to ask Abraham about his wife. Where is Sarah, your wife, they said. And you know as well as I do in social media world, people are willing to reveal some of the dumbest and yet most private personal things about themselves in Facebook, on Facebook. However, if someone asks you for your social security number or maybe your bank account, we would probably hesitate. But if someone asks us about our spouse, we are more than willing to tell them. However, questions like that were not typical in Abraham's day, especially from strangers. It was probably contrary to the common courtesy to ask a man about his wife in this way, especially asking of her by name. But there's more here than the possible uncomfortable question about the man's wife. It was possible if these men were from the area, they might know that Abraham had a wife. They might even know that her name was Sarai. But how did they know that her name had recently been changed by God? In the previous chapter of Genesis 17, verses 15 and 16, Moses reveals that the Lord had appeared to Abraham and promised him that his wife Sarai would give birth to a son. Then the Lord said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her and she shall be the mother of nations. Kings of people shall come from her. You see, the Lord had changed Abraham's wife's name from Sarai, meaning princely, to Sarah, meaning princess, because she would be the mother of nations and kings of people would rise from her. But how would these three strangers know that? Well, because one of the strangers was God, the father in a human form. The other two were angels, his messengers, though it was not revealed to us until the 13th verse of our text. Whether concerned or not, Abraham answered the question here in the tent. It was then that God revealed the purpose of his coming to Abraham. God had already revealed to Abraham and Sarah they would give birth to a son at the age of 90, the son whom the promised Savior would ultimately come. Now in mercy the Lord came as a stranger to personally reveal to Sarah that she would give birth to a son. So it was different this time. The promise was spoken out loud in Sarah's hearing as we hear in verses 10 through 12. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life, and behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, and Sarah and, uh, had grown old, or Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore Sarah laughed within her, saying, After I have grown old, Shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? Now this is somewhat of a complex question for you ladies. If then, of course, you had, suppose, or suppose you were 90 years old, you might be a grandmother or even a great-grandmother. How would you react if someone told you that you were going to have a child? Well, probably would react like Sarah did. She laughed. She reacted like most human beings would. After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure? 
Such a reaction is warranted except when the promise comes from God. Abraham and Sarah had been promised that from them a great nation would rise, more numerous than the sands of the seashore and the stars in the sky. But since God hadn't given them any children, of course, they tried to make it happen themselves with Hagar, Sarah's Egyptian maid 13 years earlier. The boy Ishmael and his descendants would become a great nation, but the promised Savior would not come from him. So Sarah laughed at the promise of God, but she is not the only one. Abraham had also laughed when it was revealed to him, but perhaps not in unbelief, but joy. In a year's time, when they had a son, they would name him Isaac, which means laughter. And Sarah would say in Genesis 21, 6 and 7, God has made me laugh, and all who hear will laugh with me. Who would have said to Abraham and Sarah that Sarah would nourish children? For I have bore him a son in his old age. But under that tree, it wasn't a laughing matter. God's promises never are. Because he is faithful. He keeps his promise. No matter how fantastic or unbelievable. After all, with God, nothing, no word or promise of God is impossible. Whether it be the creation of the world, the birth of a child to a barren woman, the birth of a son, a virgin or the promise to create faith in our hearts with God all things are possible therefore shortly when you hear the words of Jesus this is my body given for you this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins do not laugh. Do not take it lightly. Laugh only for joy, knowing that this promise of God is true and certain. When the world around us laughs at the promises of Jesus, of Jesus' return to judge the living and the dead, neither tremble nor doubt, but remember the promise of God from Scripture. We hear in 2 Peter 3, verses 3 and 4 and 8 and 9, that scoffers will come in the last day, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. And verses 8 and 9, But beloved, do, for, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It is a dangerous thing to make light of or laugh at the promises of God. In this case, the Lord called out Sarah in her tent and called her to repentance, as we read verses 13 and 15. And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child since I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, No, but you did laugh. Brothers and sisters in Christ, there's a little something for us here. Yes, we should be ready 
We should look for opportunities to exercise our faith in works of love, doing so in thanksgiving for the love our Savior Jesus has shown us. Yes, we should not doubt, but dwell on the promises of God, hold them in our hearts of faith. And finally, we should remember that God knows the thoughts of our hearts and minds. He knows when we laugh. He knows when we doubt. He knows when we are in the dark and in the light. He knows all things, yet he still loves us so much that he sent his son born of the Virgin Mary for the whole world to make things right, to pay the debt of our sins, to take away our guilt. Fully knowing his disciples, the same night Jesus, or the same night Jesus on that night when she was betrayed, he took a little bread and a little wine and said in their hearing, along with the bread and wine, that he would give them his true body and blood to conform their debt was paid in full. After all, is anything too hard for the Lord? He promised a 99-year-old man and his barren wife a son, and he delivered. He promises us still greater things, a home in heaven. God help us to ever cling forever to those promises, which are no laughing matter. Indeed, a little something for everyone. Amen. Please rise for the peace. And now may the peace of God, which passes all our understanding, keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Please rise for prayer. We give thee but thine own, whatever the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone, a trust, O oh Lord, from thee. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for your great goodness and mercy. You have sent your only begotten Son to become incarnate and to redeem us from sin and everlasting death. We ask you to enlighten our hearts by your Holy Spirit through the means of grace. 
that we may evermore give you thanks for your grace and may we comfort ourselves with the same in all time of tribulation and temptation. Send forth labors into your harvest who teach the word in its truth and purity that your joyous gospel may be heard in every land and nation. Grant health and wisdom to our government and all who are in authority that they may dwell in peace in this land of freedom. Send our land good weather and needed rains that we each may eat our daily bread and offer our first fruits unto you. Bless the efforts of the business workers and all laborers and help them in their needs, providing all for their good. Protect our homes and families from all danger of body and soul, that we may live a life pleasing to you here on earth and hereafter in eternity with you and all our brothers who have gone before us. These and whatsoever other things I would have, have us ask of thee, O God, grant unto us for the sake of the bitter suffering and death of Jesus Christ, thy only Son, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Please be seated as we join in our next hymn, hymn number two, uh, 290.
thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord,
crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ has now bestowed upon you his holy body and blood, whereby he has made full satisfaction for all of our sins, strengthens and preserves you in true faith unto everlasting life. Peace be with you. Depart in peace.
Thank you. 